Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Welcome to the third module of Improving the Way We Work, uh, focusing this week on standard operations. And uh, hello, my name is Ian Smith, uh, Program Lead for Improvement Methodology in NHS England's Sustainable Improvement Team. Uh, and with me today again is Michael Anderson, also from the Sustainable Improvement Team. Uh, we'll be the faculty for today's webinar, uh, webinar bringing you again, uh, sadly, I think, our Continuous Improvement Double Act for the remainder of the session. Before we get uh, too far into it, we'll have a quick reminder of the feedback icons and ways to, uh, to interact. Uh, so first of all, the feedback icons uh, that we have, uh, they are on the, um, the right-hand side of the screen. You will see that there is a little hand icon and a little megaphone icon. Uh, both of those can uh, can be used to draw attention to um, to yourself if you need help. You can raise the hand, or uh, the little megaphone on some of the activities. We might ask you to use that, uh, and we'll have a go of that megaphone now. I, if we click on the megaphone, if you can see it, uh, you will see a little sub menu pop up which says uh, things like yes, no, uh, or even applause. Uh, so let's have a, a quick go and see if we can get a green tick. Uh, Red Cross, if you feel so inclined, or, or even applause or laughter. Uh, if we've reached such giddy heights already at the start of the webinar, I would think not. So we'll have a little look in the, in the box, and I will see what uh, icons are coming up. Yep, <clears throat> it looks like a lot of us are giving us green ticks. Uh, too slow for someone, bless you. Uh, we'll try to speed up. We do have a lot to cover, and uh, a couple of you are laughing already, which is, uh, I don't know if it's a good sign or a bad sign, but we've definitely got the hang of the feedback icons. So the next thing that we will we will use is the uh, the chat box. You can see the chat box again on the bottom right hand side of the screen. If it's not there, you need to click on the blue, possibly red, as it is now. Chat icon looks like a little cartoon cartoon box on the top right hand of the screen. We'll bring the chat box up, and if you could type something in, you see somebody says the sound's a little bit crackly. Uh, we'll see if we can do anything about that. I have just picked up a new phone this morning, so hopefully it's working well enough. Um, it's working okay in the audio check, so hopefully it will hold up. Uh, and we see Mark there saying hello. So that's grand. If you can uh, try the chat box, that is super. And we'll also be using uh, today <coughs> the um, some of the annotation tools. So, oh, and before I get in trouble, if you do send something in the chat box, if you could mark it as uh, for all participants, that would be very much appreciated, and everybody will be able to see the comment that you make. So annotation tools, move on to those. We'll definitely use those a little bit later this afternoon. On the top left of the screen now, you'll see something that looks like a pen or a paintbrush. And if you click on that, you'll see some uh, various annotation tools underneath. We're going to use the top one, which is the arrow. And if I skip forward onto the next screen, which is the doodle page, you should be able to pop an arrow on the screen, and we'll see that we are all OK with that. Yeah, that's looking good. Arrows coming in. Let's wait there. And some drawings as well. Um, is this going to be a big hello? It's a hi. Uh, it always worries me when people start to draw on the screen because you never quite know what you are going to get. But we've got the hang of that as well, so that's grand. So we'll press on. We'll move on into uh, the rest of the session. Come back to some of those tools a little bit later on. So what did we do last week? Uh, we looked at uh, visual management and workplace organization using the uh, the five steps of the 5S uh, process. We also had a little bit of discussion about communication cells uh, and some examples of how some of those have been established and used virtually by some of our colleagues. Uh, and we encouraged you uh, at the end of last week's sessions to do some homework and have a little bit of go at doing some 5S. Uh, certainly some people did, uh, Zoe, Joe, and Becky, I don't know if you're on the call, uh, but Zoe, Joe, and Becky posted some examples of some 5S work they have been doing at Oak House in, uh, in Rotherham, which we can see uh, there on the screen. <coughs> and uh, hopefully there'll be many more examples come through. So you can see the example, that's just a, a lift straight from the Yammer page. You can check that out. You can see some of the changes that they've made to help them organise what looks like uh, what looks like some of their stationery cupboard to me. 
little, uh, say this a comment there to say someone had to go uh, sick last week. Where can I find the webinar? Webinars have been recorded, as will this one be, and they're all available to view on the uh, the CI SharePoint page, or will be posted very shortly after the uh, the webinars uh, end, and we can download them and convert them into video. You're welcome. Uh, so we'll get into this week's session, which is on standard uh, operations. So again, <laughs> we have here our uh, continuous improvement and lead house. Uh, we've looked uh, the previous weeks at value waste PDSA visual control 5s. This week we're in the uh, the rightmost column, looking at standard operations uh, and standard work. So the objectives for today uh, are as follows. So by the end of the session, we will have specified and discussed what the aim of standard work is and what it's trying to achieve. We have looked at process variation, demonstrated how that can creep in through an interactive uh, exercise, po possibly a world first. I don't know, certainly one we've done in a classroom, but we've not been able to uh, do it virtually previously. Uh, we look at the, uh, the core elements of standard work, and we will describe the difference between lead and cycle time as well. So <clears throat> why standard work? Why is this something that can help us in our improvement work? So we've got a quote here from a good colleague of ours in the States, Gary Kaplan, Chief Executive of Virginia Mason Medical Center, uh, very possibly one of the, uh, the best organizations in the world at, uh, at lean continuous improvement in, uh, in healthcare. Then he has this to say about stand work. He, he says, the best way to improve quality is to eliminate waste and variation. Uh, and standard work improves quality, reduces safety hazards, frees up time to take better care of patients. So effectively, what standard work can do for us is to, uh, to help engineer safety into patient care. That's basically make our processes more reliable. Uh, it can help us to teach new staff the most effective way that we've learned to do a particular piece of work. So it helps with reliability and effectiveness. Uh, and because we've documented our best known ways to do things, we can continue uh, update and adopt new best practices as we learn them uh, or as we generate them through the plan do study out cycle. So <clears throat> we'll have a quick think here about uh, what standard operations are. So standard operations are effectively the documents that capture the standard work. So we use a, a relatively simple set of documentation. We have an example of one a little bit later on that sets out using uh, key elements what the standard work is. Uh, and to create these, we need to know two things. Uh, the first we've uh, discussed a little bit and we'll talk about a lot more, which is standard work. What's the most effective way to get the process done? Uh, and that might be a, a collective activity to figure out amongst ourselves what our best known way is if it is not already documented. Uh, and we also need to know something about how long it will take us to do it. Uh, and we need to, to know a thing called uh, tax time, which we will define for you a little bit later in the session but it's effectively understanding what rate we have to work at if we are going to get uh, today's work done today. So standard work, the first of these elements, what, what is it? Um, the definition is that it's agree, an agreed upon repeatable sequence of work assigned to a single individual at a pace that meets customer demand. Uh, so it's a little bit wordy, but the important thing there is it's agreed upon and it's repeatable. So it's a process that we've documented uh, and we can repeat it and do, we can do it consistently again each time. So the idea of that is if we can do that, is that we can eliminate variation to achieve customer satisfaction in every instance of operating a particular process. So we've got an example here to illustrate uh, these concepts of standard work and process variation. In the center of the screen, hopefully you can see the box that's labeled as a process. Uh, and we, uh, in continuous improvement and lean work in particular, we conceptualize all of our work as processes. And processes are effectively uh, interrelated activities that transform some inputs into some outputs. So we put some stuff in and we want to get some stuff out. So in our case, the inputs that we have to our processes are typically ourselves, our staff who do the work in our organization, and the various equipment and supplies that we use to do our work. Uh, what we want to get out of our processes, particularly healthcare processes, uh, is safe, uh, effective, and good quality care, which delivers uh, good outcomes for patients. Or in our case, in a more administrative setting, we still want safe, effective, good quality work that delivers the outcome that is needed. Uh, and there are various inputs 
into these things. So if we have variation in these inputs, which we've discussed a little bit, so we've got variation with our staff equipment and supplies, we can expect that to feed through uh, into our outputs and our outcomes, uh, and we can see variation in those. The idea of, under, uh, of stand work is to understand these outputs. We can measure those using measurement for improvement, and we can use what we learn about those and the variation in those to manage our inputs. Uh, so if we have variation with staff and how we do our work, we can go through a very structured process, which we'll describe, about creating standard work. And that standard work can help reduce the variation uh, in that particular input. If we have variation in our equipment, in availability equipment, we could think about last week and some of the techniques that we looked at for organising the workplace to make sure that it is available and ready <coughs> to use as and when needed. Uh, and similarly for supplies, if there's vari uh, variation in availability of supplies, we can use visual management tactics to, um, to organise and make sure that supplies arrive and are ordered appropriately so they're ready for use. If, if we can add to that some reliability and some, um, some removal of waste to release time, we can expect to see the variation in our outputs reduce and hence the variation in our outcomes reduce also. So, by way of uh, example, Mr. Smith, hopefully. I'm going to jump <laughs> jump in at this point. Uh, people are having trouble hearing you, I think. So, um, if it's okay with you, I'll do these next few slides, and I'll get you to dial off and dial on. I will give computer. that a go. If you use your computer audio, I think it might be a little bit clearer. I just don't want people to not be able to hear what we're doing. That would be great. Okay, so. Hello, everybody. Sorry, I'm jumping in earlier than I should be, but I thought this was uh, the best way to do it. Hopefully, everybody can hear me okay. Um, ah, great. Thanks, Debbie. Yes, it's just Ian's Geordie accent, I imagine, that's getting in the way. So we've got a practical example for you. So we asked you all to bring a square of paper with you, or to have one with you at your desk or wherever you are. Uh, could you give me a green tick if you've managed to get a square of paper? Um, that would be useful to see. Oh, we've got some green ticks, thank God. That was just going to be across the board, no one having got one. So if you haven't managed to get one, now's your chance to just quickly grab a piece of paper. It doesn't necessarily have to be square. It does really help if it's square, but uh, it doesn't have to be. I'll give you just five seconds to go grab a sheet of paper, and then we'll start this activity. Okay. So hopefully you're sat there with a square of paper, a piece of paper. Uh, what I'd like you to do first is I'd like you to fold it in half, please. OK. Once you've folded it in half, uh, I'd like you to then fold it in half again. Two folds in half. And guess what's coming next? Yeah, you guessed it. One more fold in half. So you should have folded in half, folded in half, and then folded in half again. So you're not undoing it every time you fold it. You're just folding, then folding, then folding. So you should end up with a much smaller piece of paper in front of you. Once you've got to that stage, I'd like you to tear off one corner, please. This will test the, uh, the strong people from the weak people. I always have to use a pair of scissors, sadly, to do this. I'll, I'll openly admit that. But uh, if you've got the strength, please tear off a corner. If you haven't, I'll give you a few seconds to go grab some scissors or something to cut off a corner or use your teeth. Origami, not quite. <laughs> Done without teeth. Nice. I'm in the dental teeth. <laughs> okay, good. That's probably bad uh bad etiquette from me suggesting using your teeth. Don't use your teeth. Ah, which corner? Well, therein lies the mystery. Any corner you like. 
the instructions are fold in half, fold in half, fold in half, tear off a corner. Okay, I'm hoping you've all got there. So I'm going to give you on the next slide a couple of different examples. So Mr. Smith, if you could move us on, that would be much appreciated. And I'd like you to grab your pointer tool from the top left and tell me which one you ended up with. I ended up with that one on the top left. So did Ian. Anybody end up with any of those or there's something different there? can invite Mr. Smith to come back in and have a chat, see if his audio has improved. Oh, we're getting well, we could, we could see whether the audio sounds any better. Sounds okay to me, but we'll put it to the test in a second and ask people if they can hear you. Mm. So you've just got to keep on talking. Keep filling this time because <laughs> it's an audio test and it's also... They may not, they, they may not want to hear uh, any more from me as it goes. Who knows? Uh, screen's gone blank. That's not good. Everybody else. Mind, apparently. We seem to be set by terrible gremlins today. Yeah, it's not been the best so far, has it, in terms of technology, but, you know, it's, we've it's, done all we it's can. It's not doing us any favours, I don't think. Okay, Heather's got something different. Okay, so, we've got a widespread there. Anybody having problems Indeed. still hearing Mr. Smith, or is it a little bit clearer now? Until I start speaking again, of course, and uh, and then we'll find out. I wonder if the croakiness is just the uh, the terrible cold that my children have given me, and we're just mistaking that for a bad line. But this is uh, this is in fact how I sound today. I tried to blame, blame your accent earlier, but it, it didn't work. Um, they can all hear you now, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop oh, interrupting. Good. I'm gonna give the ball back to you, and I'm gonna let you carry oh, thank on. You. Okay. Uh, well, the good news I think is that uh, my bit's nearly done, so we will be able to move on very, very shortly. So I think what we're looking at here, I think hopefully what it illustrates, you can see that a few people got the same as Michael and I, most people got something else or something different again. And if you consider how simple that, uh, that process is, yet we all got quite different results, and you think about what we do every day, it illustrates just how easy it is for variation to, quick, uh, to creep in to our processes quite effectively or quite easily. So what can we do about that? So we can think about how standard work can start to remove some of that variation. And we just have a little bit of thinking about what, what's the difference between standard work versus standard process, uh, and what the difference is. So a standard process uh, is an important part of standard work. It helps us to depict what are the process steps, uh, basically how do we do it, uh, what are the key points, um, um, why do we do it that way, and the key point reasons why, why it's important. So standard work also specifies how long it will typically take to do a particular process. So the difference, therefore, between standard process and standard work is one of, is one of time. Knowing how long a process is uh, realistically going to take to do is an important part of that. It's very helpful for us to understand um, how we balance up our capacity with demand or to tap time, as we'll look at very shortly. So the key elements, therefore, of standard work are what to do, the key steps in the process, how to do it, uh, that's the important key points, the equipment we need, the supplies we, we need, the, um, the, the safety element, uh, or just the, uh, the specific technique or knack to make the process particularly effective. And then the key point reason why is it done that way, and how long will it take? So we're answering very simple questions. What do we do? How do we do it? Why do we do it like that? How long will it take us to do? Uh, and we're uh, adopting this um, particular uh, set of definitions, again, from colleagues uh, in the US, uh, in Virginia Mason, who worked with us previously in the past. And by way of example, from the NHS website, uh, in terms of uh, hand hygiene for standard situations to make sure your hands are properly cleaned, there is a video on there. We won't play it on here. Uh, videos and WebEx don't uh, mix particularly well, and the gremlins are already with us today. But on there, you'll find um, a video showing how to wash your hands with standard hygiene. It tells us what to do. It shows us how to do it. It explains why we follow the steps in that particular way, and it tells us how long it should typically take to do a thorough job 
of washing hands, and that is around 20 seconds, uh, which they say is roughly as long as it takes to sing happy birthday to, uh, to yourself twice, apparently. Uh, and we have uh, an extension of that example here, is, is how we would write out a standard operation for washing your hands following the process on the NHS website video. And you can see, again, it follows those, um, those elements of what the key process steps, which are listed uh, and numbered down the left-hand side, how, which are the key points. So how do we actually do that uh, process? What are the key points uh, for making that hand washing process as effective as it can be? And the why, the key point reason tells us why we do it in that particular way. It's very, very helpful uh, when we're teaching a process to, uh, to new staff, if we've got those, um, those three elements, particularly the why do we do it in that particular way. So the benefits, therefore, of standard work, it helps us to see and eliminate waste. Uh, we'll have a look at a structured process for designing standard work that tells us how we do that very, very shortly. Helps us achieve continuous flow. This is where how long is very important. Uh, the key to flow is balancing capacity and demand, so knowing how long a process takes uh, and how many times we might have to run that process to do today's work today is very, very key for helping to achieve flow. Uh, because we document our best known way, it helps us to hold improvement gains from our continuous improvement activities. Uh, and because we do that, it also stimulates uh, more improvement. Uh, and again, as we've just mentioned, it helps to train others to do what we uh, know to be our currently our best known way. Not a fixed known way, but our best current known way. So uh, I think Mr. Anderson's going to come back in. Hopefully his audio is holding up. Uh, and hopefully mine is too. Uh, and we'll have a little bit of a discussion uh, through the chat box, I think, on these questions. Uh, I'm hoping that's at the stage that we're at, Mr. Anderson, is it? Correct. Hello. Yes, yes I'm back. So we wanted to ask the audience, didn't we? Of, we did. uh, what does it mean if two people take a different amount of time to do the same piece of work? What does that mean for people? So let's see what people think in the chat box about what they think about that question. What does it mean if two people take a different amount of time to do the same work? There, there is one who's very competitive. Uh, now, this being the NHS, so that could very well be the case. Training. Uh, depends uh, on the I'm reason. It depends on the quality of output someone is seeing. Uh, could be new. Uh, like this one might be doing it different ways. Uh, could be something to so could something to do with diversity. Could be. I don't know. What else do we see, Michael? Different skill sets. One might be a perfectionist. That's a very good one because that links back to the wastes <laughs> we talked about in the first week. Giving more than giving the customer more than is needed. The, there's a good one here. It's just popping. Could be due to interruptions. It's an yes. interesting point here. Yeah. Yeah, we could. Okay. Definitely. Uh, should we ooh, fast, faster with technology? Uh, now it's funny you should mention that, uh, <laughs> as we can <laughs> see shortly. Uh, should we move on to the second question, uh, Mr. Anderson? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, how will the computer? Yes. That's <laughs> <laughs> that today already. Second question. How will you know if you're eliminating the waste in your work? So, um, in other words, how do you know if you're making improvements? Because a change isn't necessarily mm. always always an improvement. What what ways are, you, uh, are out there for you to use to know that you're making things better? Yes, we'll give people a chance to think about that. Uh, there was one for us here on the la on the last question from Carolyn. Uh, you could be easily distracted. I do fall for that. I've got this sort of my kind of mentality of uh, oh shiny. <laughs> Mm. Now, here we go. Quality of work, time it gets delivered. Could compare the work done uh, to the practice. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, you're doing something quicker, but with the satisfactory result. Mm -hmm. Still achieving the required output, but faster, meeting the set standards. Measuring and before reduction and after. in time. I like that. Um, I'm pleased to see people bringing in this idea of measuring. Better result with the same resources or same result with less. Yes. Yeah. Adding value consistently. Yeah, that's very uh, good. Simple, simple and streamlined outputs of high quality. I quite like that. 
All very valid and all good to see that everybody's... Ah, oh, there we go. PSA. We go. That's what we wanted to see as well. Perfect. Yes, people talking about measurements and understanding simple things like before and after and seeing if there is a, a tangible change there rather than just feeling like it's better, I think is very important. Definitely. Great. Okay, we're going to crack on with the rest of this presentation. So, the next thing I'm going to talk to you about is the different definitions of time measures. And the three time measures we're going to talk about today are cycle times, which is the time it takes for one operator or one person to do one bit of work. We're going to go into these in a little bit more detail. Lead time, which is the total time required to provide the entire service from end to end. And finally, tack time, which is uh, the pace at which work is required to meet customer or patient demand. Tact is a German word, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Smith, but it's a German word for beat, and uh, it's the beat at which you need to complete your work in order to, to meet demand. Okay, so talking about cycle time then, so we've got a very simple example for you on the screen here. Uh, we've got a patient being seen by their doctor. We've then got the patient having a scan, and then we've got the patient having the results from that scan. So each of those is an individual cycle of work. So um, the weight between the cycles is not included, but the weight within each cycle is. So the doctor on the left there, the consultation. So let's say during that consultation, that doctor has to walk all the way to the other end of the office to get some notes um, that takes about four minutes to do. You still include that four minutes in the 15 minute cycle time, but the weight between that consultation ending and the scan starting is not included in any cycle times. So hopefully that's making sense for anybody. If, uh, if that's not clear, please give me a hand up or a red cross and I'll, I'll try and go into a bit more detail. We're going to move on past cycle times and we're going to talk about lead times. So lead time is all of those cycle times added up plus the weights in between. So here we've got 15 minutes for the, for the consultation and we've got a 10 minute wait until the scan and then a five minute wait until we get the results. You can tell that we're incredibly glass half full in the uh, sustainable improvement team. We're very optimistic and we're, we're saying that there's 10 minutes between one and five minutes between the other. I think you could realistically add the word month instead of minute there to some places, but we're gonna stay positive. So lead time is from the process beginning right the way through to the end and every wait that's included within that. Okay, reducing the lead time. So when we look at reducing our lead time, the first thing we want to focus on is the uh, the waiting between the two cycle or between the cycle times. Okay, so if you've got waiting in your process, that is a really good place to start uh, when you're thinking about removing time. Okay, and saving yourselves time. So here, even though we've only got 10 minutes and five minutes, we want to be asking the question: Why does why does that need to happen? Why is that wait there? and how can we reduce it as much as possible. And if we strip out that weight, we're gonna reduce our lead time from 92 to 77 in this hypothetical example. But already, without having to look at any real detail or any really detailed processes, we are stripping out time and we know that we can strip those, those weights out and that really, really helps. So the first step to reducing your lead time is to look at the weighting between cycle times. The next thing to do is think about, okay, well, I remember observing that in that consultation, the doctor had to go all the way down the corridor and then come all the way back again. So let's think about how we can change those weights. How can we strip out the weighting and the waste from each of those, um, those cycles? So we think about stripping it out and we reduce each cycle time a little bit every time. You know, continuous improvement we've said over and over again is about getting continually better. So you're not gonna strip out all of the time instantly. But if you can strip out a few minutes here and there, you can start to severely reduce your lead time, okay? So we're only stripping two or three minutes out of each one there, but it does make a big difference to the overall. Attack time helps you to understand um, how, what your beat of work needs to be. So how much time do you have to do the work that you need to get completed? So this isn't about, you know, in a GP surgery, having a big bell that goes off every 10 minutes and if you're still in talking to your doctor you get booted out of the office and you can't come back again this is about just having that understanding that if it takes me 15 minutes to do one piece of work and i know on average it needs to take me 10 then i'm going to be running slightly behind and we need to think about our scheduling and we think about how long our appointments are and it doesn't have to be things like clinics it can be things like you know if we need to produce 
three reports every week. We know how often we need to produce one report and we shouldn't be waiting till Friday afternoon to try and produce all of those reports. We want to, we want to try where if we can to spread those out. So I've got a little task for you. So try this exercise for me. There are 48 patients that want to see their doctor today. The clinic is open for nine hours, but closed for one hour for lunch and breaks. What would the tack time be in minutes? So minutes is the crucial bit for working this out. Answers in the chat box, please. So this this is the uh, the maths bit then, is it, Michael? It is, yeah. We, we didn't warn them about this. Cruel, no, but we should we'll maybe should have. Roz has gone in early, but I think she's she's fallen for the not converting to minutes that uh, a lot of people do. Julie's in as well. Ooh. Oh, well, we've got, we've got some we've deviation got some going on. Variation yeah. we've got, yeah. Okay, we've got six, 7.5, 10, 10, 10. Mm. I'm going to put you out of your misery in a second. We're going to show our workings, like being back <laughs> in school. Yeah. So if we have eight hours of work, because it was open for nine but closed for one, we've got eight hours in total that converts to 480 minutes and we've got 48 patients uh, so it is 10 minutes congratulations to those yes. people that said 10 so one patient needs to leave the clinic every 10 minutes for us to know that we're able to meet our demand okay and there's a lot of other calculations that sit around tack time you can work out how many workers you need to be there to be able to um, meet demand you can work out how many Op, uh, how many pieces of work need to be going through the system. But as a, as a start of 10, tack time is uh, very, very useful for understanding what your demand is and how you need to meet it. So we've got another world first uh, activity for you to try today, which could yep. go, but we're, we're optimistic, aren't we? It's going to go brilliantly. Yes, it's going yep. to go brilliantly. So this is going to involve you. Uh, if you're on, hopefully majority of you are on your work laptops or computers. If you're on an iPad, you may struggle with this one, but we'll see how you get on. And we're going to do, uh, oh, actually, we're not going to get there yet. Oh, I'm jumping oh, in myself, keen. Mr. Smith. I am very keen to do that exercise. We've got one more slide. So we're going to talk about how to create standard work first, okay? So the way to do this is to just get out and see the process, okay? So get out and see what's happening. Take a stopwatch with you. Take a pencil. I mean, we've got to take a video camera on there. I don't think that's ever gone down well when I've tried to do that with people. Generally, people don't like being videoed at work, but if they're keen to, it's great to have there. But pencil and a stopwatch. Observe with keen eyes, so big eyes, big ears, small mouth. Okay, that's the way we think about it. You want to be there seeing what's going on, but you're not interrupting people. You're not constantly asking what's happening. You're not getting involved in the work. You're just there in a, as an observer. Record what you see, so mark down your timings, mark down the, the process that's happening of, and what's, what's actually, uh, what people are actually doing. And then, as we said earlier, use PDSA, so define the work, identify the wastes, remove it, test it and standardize it, and then implement it. So you're just doing small improvements. You're seeing, okay, well, actually, I, I observed that we did this and we did that a lot of the time, and that caused a lot of waiting for the, for the customer. How about we try something different there? How about we change it? So it's all about trying to create the best possible way that we can to do our work. And it's all about reducing the variation of standard, uh, standardization, hmm. reducing variations, that's what I wanted to say. Okay, great. Next, we've got, let's create a standard, go. the Microsoft challenge. Here we go, Ian. This is the one. I got too excited. Yep. So what we'd like you to do We'd like you to open up a Microsoft Excel second, uh, a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet in a second, please. Once you've opened it up, we'd like you to go to a new sheet or a new tab, type in the numbers from one to 20, add the numbers together, and once you've done that, post it in the chat box. So that's your instructions, okay? I'm gonna tell you to go in a second, and once you've worked it out, you've got the total, Post it in the chat box and hit send. Okay, ready? Off you go. Some very speedy people there. <coughs> very quick.
give you a few more seconds. Still some coming in. Oh, someone's had a computer problem there. Oh, how frustrating. It really is gremlin day today. It is, yeah. It's uh, actually the computer's not yeah, paying attention. They're flying in there. Okay, I'll give you another couple of minutes just to see what people have got. at this point where you're hoping people aren't just looking at what other people have typed and uh, doing it that way. We'll, ne we'll never know. <coughs> okay. So we had Mr. Smith sneakily in the background there, timing. Uh, people just, coming just in. Watching her. Got yeah. a, a rough average of how long it took people there, Ian? Uh, well, uh, we, we were getting different results. Um, Emma was in a very, very quick. I made it two seconds, and uh, and Emma had come in with uh, with a result, uh, and it went up from there. I'd say the average was around 17 seconds was a fairly common result where it started to go quite uh, quite quickly. Pretty good, I'd say. Pretty good. Very good. So let's see if we can improve that with a standard approach to this. Okay. So we've designed and we've put forward a standard that we'd like to all to follow. Callie, you don't get a prize for coming last. It's, it's just embarrassing. Um, so the standard is when you've opened up Excel, we'd like you to type the first three numbers into the top three boxes just like that. Once you've done that, highlight them. And once they're highlighted, if you hover your mouse over the bottom right, you get the little black cross, which is called Mr. Smith. It's known as the fill handle, I believe. The fill handle, we think, yes. Mm. Yeah, and once you've got that fill handle, you've got that black cross, click and drag down. And as you drag down, you'll see the numbers going up. Uh, and once you hit the number you want, so you can see there on the screen, there's a little number 20, which is where I wanted to get to. You're gonna stop and you're gonna let go of your mouse click. Once you've let go, all of the numbers will appear and they'll be highlighted. And at that point, you're going to have a look down into the bottom right of your screen and there'll be a little box that says sum and that will give you the answer. So for this one, everybody was correct. Everybody did it in a very quick way. We're going to run this example again and we'd love you to try and use the standard we've just set out. So this time, we're going to get you to <coughs> open up Excel, go to a new sheet, new tab, and do the numbers from 21 to 40 this time. Add them together and post your result in the chat box. Are you ready? Off you go. Look at this. Very good. <coughs> Flying in. Okay, so I think we had some very clever people on this call already. So what I'd be interested in now is if you can use your little megaphone icons, if you knew how to do that before us setting that standard, please give us a tick. If you've learned something new, please give us a no across. So did you know how to do that before we started, yes or no? Oh, it's interesting. It is interesting. What were your averages like there, Mr. Smith? Uh, we, I would say we were slightly quicker uh, the second time around, but uh, having said that, they were pretty quick the first time as well. Slightly quicker. Good. Mm -hmm. um, as you can see, we've got even more continuous improvement coming in the chat box. Somebody there saying you only need to type two numbers in. We had a standard of typing one, two, and three, but actually you just need to do one and two. Saving more time every time, constantly evolving. And the process of waiting for Excel to open the first time. Aha, yes, good point, Rose. That's very good, yes. It does take a while to load up. Uh, if people want to see this again, uh, we're not actually going to pop back to it just yet, but it will be on the recording. So if people do want to go in and see it, uh, they can. 
Just have a play around. Uh, oh, Amanda only typed in two numbers. Ah, okay. <laughs> few people struggling. That's fine. We are constantly improving, and we're constantly trying to develop virtual activities which demonstrate things that we do physically in a classroom. So this is new for us. So we thank you all for being guinea pigs in our first ever test of this game live. Hopefully, some of you saw that uh, by creating a standard or putting a standard practice in place, we got a reduction in variation, and we can then push and start to improve even further from there. Yes, good to know that two numbers are sufficient. Very good. Yes. Okay. Thank you all. So I'm going to give you an example now of where this has been put into practice. So um, Cumbria Northeast flu immunization process. We touched on this on week one, but we're going to go into a little bit more detail today. So before they started, they looked at their current situation and their weekly process uh, took one uh, whole time equivalent, one and a half days capacity per week. So that was 11.25 hours uh, to manage the process outlined below. So you can see the process is made up of five steps, each one taking uh, at least an hour and having to be completed. Uh, additionally, there's a high risk of data errors. So because somebody was doing this manually, it meant that there was human errors more likely to occur. Uh, and they thought it just, just wasn't the best way of doing it. And it'd been going on like this for a while. So they decided to take a step back and have a look at it. So what they did was they did some brainstorming. They looked at um, they did what's called a, a fishbone diagram there. They looked at what the causes could be for some of this stuff, and they, they realized that a lot of those are sort of human error or, or man-made causes. They did a problem statement, so they worked out, OK, well, why is this an issue? Remember we talked about the five whys in previous sessions, trying to dig down and get to the root cause of this? This team, obviously wanting to go above and beyond, have done six whys. But they got down to the root cause that the team have accepted the process for what it is. And actually, they need to challenge that, and they need to change things. And then they looked at, OK, well, what are the options we've got? Um, and, and what are the impact of those options? So they used uh, what's called an impact matrix there on the right-hand side. And they said, OK, well, is there anything that has a high impact and is relatively low effort to implement? Uh, and if anything falls into those categories, then we should be looking at those solutions. So the solution they developed was uh, an automated process where each file received from the provider is saved directly onto the network drives and is then automatically updated into the master spreadsheet when it's opened. So they used um, you know, knowledge of Excel, like we've just covered there, but in a lot more detail, and they allowed themselves to auto-populate a lot of things that are having to be done manually. So by doing that, they cut their process from five steps down to three. And more importantly, they cut it from 11.25 hours down to just 30 minutes. Uh, and that's just saving and opening a file uh, and then the PDF sending to stakeholders by your email. So that is a 95% reduction in capacity required each week to complete the process. Um, basically saving 10.75 hours, which is 150 hours over the 14 week annual cycle. So every year, 150 hours saved. And they minimize the risk of any manual data entry issues. So just by looking at something fairly simple and, and just having a quick um, PDSA cycle run through, they've come up with something amazing. And they've saved so much time for that team that they can reinvest into something else. So examples like this are the things we want to share. So there's a lot of this work going on out there. And people are doing a lot of great work. But it's about capturing it. So here, what they've done a really good job of is, is capturing the before and the after and the impact that's going to make. Um, so having those things is really powerful, and they're the sort of things we want to share. So that's why we've put that example in here in, in more detail. OK, we're going to do a quick recap with you guys. So if we can start the polling, please. We've had the maths part. It's the quiz part. Yes. So calculate tack time. You use the following equation. Is it demand versus time available? Time available divided by demand, or lead time divided by cycle time? Give Quite you a few seconds. The open, yeah, I mean, they've been here three weeks now, though, so we can't go easy mm. on them. Got to make it tough. <laughs> I think they'll get, get easier, to be fair. <laughs> OK, so once you've done that. That looks like it's closed. We'll just wait for that to come up.
definitely one of those days today, Michael. Definitely one of those days. Yeah, it feels like it. That's okay. It's a Tuesday. It's it's fine. <laughs> Indeed. Ah, there we go. <clears throat> We've got the result in. Yes, and guys. It looks Nailed it. It is time available divided by demand. Good to see that. No, actually, no one really went for the uh, demand over time available, which is the red yeah. hair in there. Good to see. Thank you. Next. The difference <laughs> between a standard process and standard work is... Ian Smith's entry of 42. Waste well, or time? Hopefully the audio held up when we did that bit uh, earlier on. We'll see how people do. I'm going to suggest they've maybe got a 50-50 bet on this one if the audio was a bit iffy though. That's true. Hopefully they've got enough time to answer. Yeah. Obscure <laughs> reference there for the Douglas Adams fans. <laughs> okay, the polling's ended. Let's get those results in. Yes, let's uh, whip the Harold Tint the moment as it pauses for the uh, the system to do its calculation and hopefully come up I with the result. People go away from these things thinking it's really tense when we're waiting for that poll to come up. Yeah, yes, it is. good. Yeah, that's a little bit good. One, correct. one more to do. One more to do. It's a simple true or false. Lead time is equal to the sum of cycle times plus all the weights in between cycles. True or false? Well, definitely a 50-50 bet for this one. If, uh, yeah. if the audio hadn't held up for that bit either. I think we're okay on this one. I've got huge faith in this we'll group. I think we'll be okay as well. Polling's ended. The suspense is killing us. And we'll continue to until the result pops up, I'm sure. It works at the rate of WebEx and nothing will make it go any quicker or slower than it. No. <laughs> Just when you want it to go quickly. Yeah. That's looking good. Solid. Yeah. Excellent. I think okay. we did all right on the recap. <coughs> I think so, we did well there. Uh, I think so. Think. The key points, Mr. Smith. Uh, well, indeed, I think we picked up the key points perfectly by the looks of things. So what we've looked at, uh, we've noted through, um, through both the Microsoft Challenge, I think, and our origami exercise, as I think one of you called it, uh, it's very easy for variation to creep into processes. Uh, even those very simple processes and the processes that we operate every day tend to be considerably more complex and complicated than the ones we've illustrated things with today. Uh, the aim of standard work is therefore to try and eliminate that variation by having a consistent, repeatable sequence uh, that we can use to do our work. Uh, and that's going to help with consistent achievement of customer satisfaction. And the core elements of standard work are what, uh, in terms of what we do, how, in terms of how we do it, why, in terms of the key point reason, why do we do it that particular way, and how long does it take us to do this particular aspect of the process. So I think that brings us roughly to the, um, to the end uh, of the module. We've just got a couple more slides uh, to look at. So one here on further resources, the simple guide to improving services will uh, help you to set up uh, and run your own continuous improvement projects using some of these techniques. Uh, and indeed, we might have a bonus surprise coming up to help you to do just that as well. There are also lots and lots of tips on various different tools um, which we've not covered in this series but can also be helpful. Uh, and the improvement hope. There are so many tools we've had to be selective about what we can look at. Uh, and if you can just step us forward another slide there, please, Mr. Anderson. So we've now seen how the various elements fit together. Uh, we've thought about value, waste, and the plan, do, study, act cycle, which is featured subsequently in all of our webinars. We've looked at uh, visual control and the 5S process to organize our workplace. Uh, and to make our work visual. And we've looked today at how we can build and document a standard operation that uh, gives us a repeatable sequence uh, and a time for particular aspects of work with that aim of reducing variation and increasing reliability. So they all sit 
on the platform of continuous improvement. And one more step forward again for me, I think we've got two more to go. So the mission, uh, and hopefully you will all choose to accept it, is, is not to, um, to dangle uh, uh, Acrobatically in the uh, in the foyer of Corey House or Skipton House or wherever it is that uh, that may, you may work on a daily basis, it is to build on the work you've already started from the homework activities over the past few weeks, where you've looked at waste and processes, you've looked at starting to eliminate some of the the basic waste with 5S. We've now looked at how we can build uh, standard processes and eliminate variation using PDSA. Uh, and we're asking people to, to take some of those uh, those early skills and put them into practice, uh, select a process uh, within your work area that you feel could benefit from some improvement, see if you can map that out with your colleagues, generate some ideas uh, that you can then test changes on using the PDSA approach, and capture your improvements and share them with others, uh, which you can do through the SharePoint site. That's my jammer might actually be easier than just sort of trying to get into Quarry House in a normal manner though. It's just just coming through, through the atrium, just dropping through on a, the atrium. On a yeah. Yeah. Uh, sure. It would certainly be quite an entrance to um to make. Uh it's a sure fine way to never get allowed <laughs> back into Quarry House. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it may cause some kind of security concern. I can't recommend it. Um no. don't listen to folks. But while you're okay. on there Mike, if you want to step us through I think to the very last side <laughs> Um, as a bonus, because uh, of the feedback that we've had from some folks about, okay, how can we use this to set up continuous improvement projects, uh, we've agreed to do a, a fourth session uh, to build on this, very much focused around how we can set up uh, a, a continuous improvement project and how can we measure for uh, improvement. Oh, thank you very much, Ola. Somebody's saying that they have found the series helpful. Uh, if you have, that is great. And if you want to come back and join us in a few weeks on Tuesday, the 10th of July, we will look at how to set up a continuous improvement project and how to use measurement within that and some simple techniques. Uh, you're there. Well, we see you there, Patrick. If you've not had enough of the continuous improvement double act, it is myself and Michael Anderson. Hopefully, the audio will hold up. Uh, and the new telephone technology will uh, will do what it is meant to do. Uh, and hopefully by the end of that session, not only will we will have the tools and techniques of continuous improvement, but we'll have a simple, usable structure to get some continuous improvement projects off the ground. So we look forward to connecting with you all again uh, on the 10th of July, which I think is about four weeks time, Mike, or three weeks? Three, I think. Three weeks, yeah, I think so. I'll be on very much wedding countdown at that point. I'll have to have lost all of the weight I need to lose. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, if you don't I'm tune in for anything I'm else, sure tune in to hear that. Yeah. Yes, Mike, Mike Landerson's <laughs> personal continuous improvement project, uh, Get Fit for Wedding 2018. And on that note, uh, I think we'll leave it there. Uh, have a great day, folks. And we will look forward to catching up with, catching up with you one more time. Tuesday the 10th for putting some of this into practice. Many thanks. Have a great day. Bye all.